All right, guys, welcome back. In this video, we want to use the force method to solve this statically indeterminate beam. When we check it out, it is two degrees indeterminate. We got three reactions here at A, we got a reaction at B, and we got a reaction at C. So we have five unknowns. We have three equations of equilibrium. That makes it two degrees statically indeterminate. If you ever have a uh, problem that is more than one degree statically indeterminate, I really don't recommend using the force method just because it takes absolutely forever to do. And the reason it takes so long is because it's actually kind of like a combination of two methods. The first thing that we always do with the force method is we use superposition to separate out the redundant reactions. And the redundant reactions are just those reactions that are over and above, or that basically put this thing over and above being statically determinate. Um, so in a case like this where you have a fixed end at, uh, on one side, then typically the redundant reactions that we can remove, you can remove any reactions really, but we want to basically remove the ones that aren't the fixed end because then that's going to make this beam look like a cantilever and that's going to... Uh, make it easier for us to work with. So first we do method of superposition to remove the redundance. And then after we also have to apply a whole other method um, to basically find the magnitudes of these forces. And that method could be the moment area method, double integration, or if you're lucky enough tables, that would really speed it up. But often you don't have like a standard enough um, system to use tables. So you're pretty much always going to be using moment area method or double integration method. All right, so let's draw this beam. Uh, let's just draw, instead of drawing these reactions, which we know are just going to be vertical point loads, um, let's just draw them as vertical point loads. So really this problem is just a cantilever beam with too many unknowns. And then one other thing that we know is that the deflection here at B and the deflection at C is going to be zero. Because if we think about the actual deflected shape of this structure once it's loaded, it's gonna come out 90 degrees, it's gonna go down something like this. And this reaction isn't going into the floor or moving anywhere, so its displacement here is going to be zero. And then it's going to do something, I don't know entirely, but it's going to sag down probably. And then again, this displacement here at C is going to be zero. So this thing can be drawn as a cantilever beam with two unknowns that we know with their zero displacement. So there's a bit of a condition there um, that, that we can use to our advantage. So really, when we're talking about using the method of superposition, um, we always draw the system without the reactions like this and we say that the original system is equal to the superposition of, of this system here without the reactions plus a system with just the first reaction and the system with just the second reaction. And really what we're after here is the deflections are compatible. So like I said, the, the deflection of the actual structure is going to be something like this. And then it's going to come back down and be something like that, um, where the deflection here is zero. Well, if we have just a cantilever beam with just applied loads going down, then basically we're going to get a deflection that looks something like this, where we're going to be getting some, some known deflection here that we can calculate using like the moment area method or double integration. Uh, and we're going to call this deflection here, let's call it y, uh, yb1. And if, we're, if we label this case one, this case as case two, and this as case three. Um, and then also here, we're going to get this deflection here. This is going to be the deflection at C in case one, which also we can calculate using one of those methods. Now, when we look at case two here, if we have a cantilever beam with a point load applied in the middle, then we're going to get an upward deflection, something like this. And uh, again, using one of those same methods, we'll have, a, we'll have a deflection here, and it'll be in terms of an unknown load, but it will just be called We'll be able to get some deflection here uh, with this, including this unknown magnitude here. So we'll call this y b2. And then we'll also get a magnitude, or sorry, a deflection here. We'll get y c2. Basically, the deflection at c caused by case 2, which is just having this unknown point load uh, acting in the center. And then here for case 3, we'd also get an upward deflection. So at the, the free end here, we'd have uh, y c. This would be the deflection at point C from case three, and this guy here, where's the middle? Yeah, right there. Uh, this would be the upward deflection YB from situation three, or case three, where we have an applied load at the very end. And if you were using tables or moment area method or something, you'd be able to really easily find these uh, in it with an actual value, um, but because we don't know the magnitude of the force, that unknown is going to be included in the expression for the deflections here at point B and C. Now, because we know the actual deflection at point B and C is zero, then this downward deflection uh, at point B, we call this YB1, has to be equal to the sum of these two upward deflections because of the principle of superposition. So we get what is equal to YB2 plus YB1. 
B3, right? The deflection due here and the deflection here. Same thing goes for the deflection at C. We know the actual deflection is zero, so this downward deflection YC1 has to be equal to the sum of these two upward deflections. So we get YC2 and YC3. And really what we have here is we have a system of equations. We have two equations and we have two unknowns. The unknowns are the magnitude BY and the magnitude CY. YB1 and YC1 are not unknowns. We can really calculate those with actual values because this is statically determinate. So we'll actually be able to find this. We'll find this. And then the unknowns for uh, basically the magnitudes BY and CY will show up in these terms. And then we can solve that and then, uh, and then we'll be able to solve the rest of the problem. All right, so let's grab this beam here, case one, and uh, let's apply the moment area method to it. So the first thing that we want to do is look at the sum of forces in the y direction. And uh, we want to recognize that we have 50 kilonewtons going down, and then this is 10 kilonewtons per meter times 10 meters. So this is 100 kilonewtons going down. So we have 150 going down. And uh, then this reaction AY here has to be 150 kilonewtons going up, right? Because it's AY is equal to the sum of all the vertical forces, basically is 150 kilonewtons in the upward direction. All right, now if we take a look at the sum of moments, we can take a virtual cut just to the right of A, so we'll get the whole beam. Um, we can just draw something, something like this, where we have this 50 kilonewtons pressing down at a distance of five meters away. And again, this is our virtual cut right here. Um, and then the resultant force from the distributed load is 100 kilonewtons, and this is would be acting uh, right here, so 15 meters away. Um, so this would be the sum of moments. We can even write this. We get 50 times 5 plus 100 times 15. Um, and then if we draw on our moment, well, the moment clearly has to be going the other way because if this is the point A that we're taking them about. This will be our internal moment, uh, MA. So it's just equal to, uh, we bring it to the other side, so it's just equal to MA, and that is equal to 1,750 kilonewtons going in this way. And when we look at that, that is going, basically that's opposite our positive sign convention. If you remember the positive sign convention where moments are positive, uh, basically on the left-hand side of a virtual cut if it's going clockwise. So really MA is equal to negative 750 kilonewtons. And this negative is important, uh, sorry, kilonewton meters. And this is important when we draw the bending moment diagram, because this is where it's going to start on the left-hand side. All right, so let's go and set up our shear force diagram and bending moment diagram. And then if we take a virtual cut, again, just to the right of point A, we know that AY is 150 kilonewtons going up, and then that means we're going to have an internal shear of 150 kilonewtons going down. And that is equal, or that is in the same sense as a positive sign convention over here. So we're starting at 150 kilonewtons. Let's just draw that on, let's say right there, and it's going to be constant in this region. All right, so let's label this as 150 kilonewtons. Um, this point load is basically going to drop us down 50 kilonewtons, so it's going to come like that. And then again, we're going to have another region in here, which is going to be at 100 kilonewtons like this. All right. And then in this last region, we have this distributed load. So we're going to be dropping by 10 kilonewtons per meter over 10 meters. Basically, we start at 100, and we're going to drop right down to zero right there. All right, so we're at 100, and then we come down to uh, zero. All right, so let's just put on some little markers here, because that and that, these are going to become our composite shapes that we're dealing with. So this length here was 5 meters, this length was 5 meters, and this length was 10 meters. So we're going to need the areas of, uh, of these composite shapes. So this is 150 times 5. This area is equal to 750 kilonewton meters. This area is equal to 100 times 5. So this is going to be 500 kilonewton meters. And then this area here is 1 half base height for this triangle. So it's a 1 half uh, times 10 times 100. It's going to be 500 kilonewton meters. All right. So for the bending moment diagram, uh, when we look at this, we were starting at a moment right at point A of negative 1750 kilonewton meters. So let's draw that on right, how about there, negative 1750. And in this region, we have a constant shear force diagram and it's positive area. So we're going to have a linear change by the magnitude of this area. So basically from here to five meters out, we get um, a change in 750 kilonewton meters. So this point here 
is negative 1,000 kilonewton meters. Right, the difference there is 750. All right, the next change in area here is also positive, so we're going up by 500. So it's going to come out to oh, somewhere like that. And we can label this point on as negative 500 kilonewton meters. And then this last change in area is 500, but we have this. It's positive, so it's going towards the positive side. But it's linear here, so we get a parabolic shape that brings us right back to zero. All right, so for the moment area method to be able to find the tangential deviation and all that, uh, basically we need to convert this to an M over EI diagram. So literally we just dra draw everything, we divide it by over EI. And we're going to want to apply the second moment area theorem from A to B and then also from the interval from A to C. And in the first case when we're taking that, basically this gives us the tangential deviation. And because we know that the tangent here at A is going to be horizontal because it's coming out of a fixed rigid connection, and the tangential deviation here at point B is going to be the actual deflection of the beam at that point. So this is going to be equal to Y B1. And basically, if we split up all of these into composite shapes, then this is the sum of all of the X bars times the areas. So we're going to need all of the X bars and areas for all of the five sections. So let's come down here and first look at this. The area of section one, we can write this as A1, and uh, that's going to be equal to base times height. So the base was five meters, and the height is 1,000 over EI, because that's where that point is. So that gives us uh, an area of 5,000 over EI. And it's X bar for AB, so let's write this as X bar AB. Basically, that is the distance of the centroid from this point, from, from point B. So we've got X bars AB. And its centroid is going to be halfway in its shape because it's a rectangle. So it'll be 2.5 meters from here to here, plus this 5 meters. So its centroid is going to be, or its X bar is going to be 7.5 meters for AB. When we do come to do the second moment area theorem for AC, uh, to find the tangential deviation at point C, we're going to get the X bars A. C, and then we're going to be taking that distance from this guy. So X bar AC, and we're just basically adding on 10 meters. So that is going to be 17.5 meters. Now, if this is all strange to you and you're not familiar with the moment area method, you can also solve these problems using the double integration method. Um, and I have made a full set of tutorials on both of those methods. So you can find those on the website or the YouTube channel. But otherwise, here are the rest of all the areas and X bars for this part of the problem. And now that we've got all of the X bars and A for section AB, which is basically area 1, 2, 3, and 4, then we can plug these into the expression and we're going to get that YB1 is equal to 63,540.625 over EI. So this is actually a known value. Like I was saying before, this is not an unknown. I'm just leaving EI in because EI is constant throughout the whole problem, or throughout the whole beam. And uh, this term actually is going to drop out later in the example, and you'll see that basically like the reactions uh, don't depend on EI. Um, like the internal stresses and the deflections and stuff do, uh, but to solve this problem, um, which is asking for the reactions and the shear force diagram, many moment diagram uh, actually does not really depend on EI. That would be up to you later as a designer to select like an appropriate cross section and material. So, um, anyways. Uh, that'll drop out later, so don't worry about that. Um, now let's do the second moment area theorem again for section AC to get the deflection uh, at C. This is going to be point C. And because the second moment area theorem, again, it gives us tangential deviation, but when we go and look at the actual problem that we're working with, like same thing, the tangent uh, in the deflected structure here at A is going to be zero. So the tangential deviation here at point C is going to be the actual deflection here or the difference between those tangent lines at point C. So that works out really nice for us. And similarly, this is just the sum of all of the X bars times the areas from A to C. So we can plug in all the values that we have here. It's going to include area one, two, three, four, and five, and then all of the X bars from point C, which we also have right here. So once we plug all that in, we're going to find that YC1 is equal to 182,290 over EI. So let's throw a box around that, and let's throw a box around YB1 as well, because this is really important. We've actually, if we come back to uh, the first part of the problem, we've actually found now YB1 and YC1, which are the known values here. And now what we have to do, I'm going to, I'm going to pause the video right here, but in the next parts of the video, 
We're basically going to repeat that same process for case two, repeat it again for case three, and, uh, and once we do that, we'll be able to have these other four terms that we're missing, right? YB2 and YC2, these guys in here are going to come from doing the moment area method on case two, and then YB3 and YC3 are going to come from when we do this case three. And then after we have all that, then we can solve this simultaneously, figure out what all the reactions are, and then draw the shear force diagram, but moment diagram. So uh, hopefully I haven't lost you guys yet. Uh, like I said, for second degree or more statically indeterminate problems, force method, like <laughs> force method sucks. It takes forever. So anyways, uh, if you guys need to watch this, then come join me in the second video and uh, we'll keep going with this problem.